Very interesting. Matthew chapter number 11, I know we've been in Psalms on uh, Wednesday night. Uh, we just finished up chapter number 26 or 25 last week, and I was planning on jumping into chapter number 26. The Lord changed my direction today, and uh, we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter number 11, if you would please. Matthew chapter number 11. Before we read the passage, we note that uh, at this point in uh, Matthew, uh, Matthew is the gospel to the Jews, the nation of Israel. And in this gospel, we see here that there was a presentation of Jesus Christ throughout this, and the nation of Israel has not responded to the Lord. And so the Lord here is making a personal appeal to individuals in this matter. And uh, I don't know about you, but I am glad that Jesus did not reject me because of my nationality or because of my race or any of those things or anything else along those lines. I'm glad because something my great-great-grandfather did, I'm not rejected as a result of that. Amen. I'm glad that I have the opportunity to come to Jesus as well. And I am so glad Jesus has given us individual soul liberty. Amen. God does not make anybody do anything they do not want to do. And someday, if people do not trust Christ as their Savior, they will die and go to hell. And, uh, but if they have trusted Christ as their Savior, they'll be with Jesus in heaven forever. And so praise the Lord for that wonderful truth. And so um, let's take a look at the text now, if you would, please. Matthew chapter number 11, pick it up in verse number 25. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father." And now notice this is capital S. He's talking about himself. Jesus speaking here. And he is capital S for the reason because he is God. But the Father, God the Father, capital F, neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son. And he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Amen. And then look at verse number 28. Come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is what? And my burden is light. Let's pray. Father, we sure do love you. We thank you for your goodness and your grace. Thank you for all that you do for us. And Father, we do pray that your will would be done tonight, not only in heaven, but also here on the earth. And right here in this auditorium, Lord, I pray your will would be done. And Father, we thank you so much for your goodness and your grace. Thank you for the wonderful gift of your only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for sending him to die in our place, Lord, so that we can have eternal life. Thank you for that wonderful gift that has been so freely offered to us. And Father, I do pray now that you'd help us to truly appreciate it, help us to love you like we ought to. And I pray, Father, once again, if there is one here tonight that is not truly born again, I do pray that they would come to know you as their Savior. And Father, I pray now that you'd work and move in our hearts and lives. God, direct me as I preach your word. And Father, I pray, dear God, that you would teach us to be able to rest in the labor. We love you. We praise you. We thank you for all that you've done for us. In Jesus' precious holy name we pray, the power of his blood we plead. Amen. And so as we were looking at this, I'm glad that even during the church age that we're in, the time of the church age, the great falling away is taking place around us as it talks about in First Thess or Second Thessalonians chapter number two, there would be a great falling away of the church. And we have seen that all over the world and especially right here in the United States of America. Church has changed from what church used to be. People are not faithful to church like they used to be. And now we see this great falling away taking place. People don't care about the way they live anymore. They live any way they want to and then still call themselves a Christian. And that is wholly unchristian. And so as we're looking at this, I'm glad that God still in our day and age still comes to individuals. I'm thankful for Revelation chapter number three, verse number 20, where it says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man 
hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Or if you're thankful for that promise, say amen. amen. I'm thankful that God will dwell with individuals today. And so I'm so glad that God has opened the door, has an open door policy. You open the door and he'll promise to come in. Amen. And so praise the Lord for that. And it's the same with the labor for the Lord. Listen, the, the simple fact of the matter is, is God says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. There is a rest. Only Jesus gives those that labor for him. There is a rest that Jesus gives only those that labor for him. Are you with me? Will you let him give you that rest? Notice with me the formula for resting in the labor. The first thing I want you to know is verse number 28, if you would please. Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I want you to notice, number one, it's a call for salvation. It's a call for salvation. The Lord here is pleading. He is pleading unto the people. Come unto me. He is making a plea. He is, is a calling for these people to come to him. John chapter number 36, verse number 37, the Bible says, all that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. The Bible clearly says that God the Father draws people to him. And it is no mistake that you're here tonight. It is no mistake that you're here at the Solid Rock Baptist Church under the sound of my voice as I preach this message. God does all things well. And as we look and see in this passage, we see here that God the Father, all that God the Father gives to the Son, he will in no wise cast out. When people come to the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation, they get salvation. Amen. It's not a, well, I don't think so. When you ask God to save you, you get saved. Amen. And that's a wonderful truth that we see in the Bible. John chapter number seven, verse number 37. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried saying, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Let him come unto me and drink. And you know what? Back in, in 2006, January 11, 2006, Jim Frost was real thirsty. And I was working myself to death thinking I was going to heaven. But I wasn't going to heaven. And I was under conviction of my salvation. And I came to the Lord Jesus that day for a drink. And you know what? That drink of salvation is fulfilling. There's no if, ands, or buts about it. Jim Frost is on his way to heaven when I die. I know that I know that I'm saved. I took a drink of living water and his name is Jesus. Can I get a witness? Boy, it's good to be saved. If you love Jesus, say amen. Man, what a wonderful thing. This call was to the religious who were trusting in some experience or, or some goodness that was so-called produced by the keeping of their religious bonds. Listen, if you think you're being good enough to get to heaven, you're not. Amen. If you think that some kind of phony baloney prayer got you to heaven, it's not. Amen. It is a receiving of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit of God comes and dwells in a person. And the Bible clearly says, old things are passed away and behold, all things are become new. A person changes at salvation. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And I'm glad because I didn't like who I used to be. I like the new me a whole lot better. Amen. And so as we look at this, we see this. I'm so glad Jesus swept all that away with the shedding of his precious blood. We don't have to work for salvation. Never did. Can I get a witness? First Peter chapter number one, verses 18 and 19. The Bible says, for as much as you know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversations received by traditions from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a a lamb without blemish and without spot. There are so many traditions like the Catholics believe that, that when a person dies, eh, no matter what, everybody's going to go to purgatory for a period of time. Everybody goes to purgatory to purge their sins. Amen. Last I checked, Jesus purged them when he washed us with his precious blood. Amen. He washed away every sin. I'm not ever going to touch the flames of hell. I'm never going to go to a place called purgatory. And listen, you can't pay penance to the Catholic church to get people out of purgatory quicker. That's a lie. The love of money is the root of what? 
all evil. That's why they say, you want to know what's going on behind the scenes? Just follow the money trail, amen? It'll take you to the real problems right away because the love of money is the root of all evil. It doesn't say, the Bible does not say, money is the root of all evil. But those that love it, there it is right there, amen? It's loving it. It's living for it. It's, it's, it's doing everything you can to obtain it. God help us not to be caught up in that trap, amen? <laughs> Miserable people who are. Revelation chapter number 22, verse number 17, and the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that heareth say, come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. You want salvation? You can have it freely. You just got to take a drink, amen, come to Jesus. And so we see his plea. He is calling for salvation. But not only do we see the plea, we also see the pledge. The pledge, look at verse number 28. And he says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. And here's the pledge. And I will give you rest. Amen. Hey, the promise is if you come to me, I'll give you rest. And I don't know about you, but I like feeling rested. Amen. I like feeling refreshed and rested. Amen. And when you spend time with Jesus and you come to him, you can feel refreshed and rested, even in the midst of laboring hard for Jesus Christ. Can I get a hallelujah right there? It's good to be born again. It is good to be saved. The pledge. Amen. Sin is a heavy load. The way the transgressor, the Bible says, is hard. And sin's a heavy load. Too heavy for any man to carry except for one, and his name was Jesus. Labor is counter with guilt. Listen, when you look at this and see what it says, Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I will what? Give, amen. I will give you rest. Rest is given. It's not a matter of anything else. And so this, this thing that people are laboring for salvation and trying to make their way into heaven, listen, the truth of the matter is, just turn that stuff over to the Lord and accept him as your Savior. And that labor is countered with give. I'll give you rest. You just come to me. All of man's goodness can never pay for his badness. Amen. And there's nothing in the Bible says that you can be good enough to take care of your badness. The simple fact of the matter is, is people go to hell because they sin and they start sinning from the time they're born. The Bible says uh, the, uh, they come forth from the womb speaking lies. Amen. And that is the truth of it. From the moment a person is born, they come screaming and crying out of the womb and lying about the, all this other craziness. They can be fed and they can be changed and dry and they'll cry and whine and fuss and complain. And you want to know why? Because they want you to pay attention to them. Amen. And that's the truth of it. And you know what I find? I find a lot of Christians are that way. And so anyways, moving along before I get myself in trouble tonight. And so as we look at this, we see this. For a perfect eternity with eternal life requires the highest of calls. It must be perfect. And no person has ever attained such perfection in this life but except one. And his name is Jesus. God himself in the flesh. He lived a perfect life so that you can I could have eternal life. The rest that Christ has offered and given us cannot be bought, earned, or merited. It is a gift. Amen. And praise God it is because it's the only way that it can be it, the only way it can be received is by being accepted. Heavy laden is accounted with rest. Once we receive this wonderful gift, all there is to do is to come and rest. One does not and cannot maintain the gift of salvation by one's own effort. Are you with me? Come unto me, all you that labor, and I will give you rest. This matter of salvation, listen, too many people think they've got to try and hang on to being saved. They think they've got to keep it and, and do right and live right and act right and all of those things. And those things are wonderful to do, but not to get to heaven. Not to hang on to heaven because I'm going there. Oh, I don't want to lose my salvation. He gives us the gift of what? Eternal life. Yes. And once we have eternal life, how can it anymore not be eternal? That doesn't even make sense. Amen. Just the, the simple fact that it's eternal life and it's a free gift. How in the world could that possibly be taken away? Once you become eternal, you are forever eternal. Amen. There's no taking it back. 
Now, that isn't a license to sin. We know that when somebody truly gets saved, they get changed, and God does the changing. And it's called, actually, we talked about it on Sunday night, this matter of sanctification, being set apart for the master's use. And at the moment of salvation, hey, listen, that positional sanctification... It takes place. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. And so we see this matter of the plea. He is crying for people. Come unto me. I do want to save you. I do want to give you rest. But you have to come. And he has promised that if you come, then he will give you that rest. Amen. And we simply rest in him and his Rest is a finished work. Galatians 5, 1, stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Now he's talking to the, he is talking to the church of Galatians. He's talking to the local New Testament church full of saved people. Can I get a witness? And he says in this passage, wherewith Christ hath, past tense, made us free. And be not a tangled again with the yoke of bondage. Psalm 116, verse number seven, return unto thy rest, O my soul, for the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee. In Jeremiah 6, 16, thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. Can I get a witness? But they said, we will not walk therein. They would not receive the Christ as the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, as their Savior. It's a call for salvation, but not only is it a call for salvation, look at it with me once again. Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Secondly, it's also a call for service. Verse number 29, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. It's a call for service. He calls for salvation. Come unto me. And you know what? You come unto me. I will give you rest. You can cease from all these labors that you're doing to try and please God and earn heaven. Listen, since I've been saved, I'm not trying to earn heaven anymore, but I am trying to please God. And the reason I'm trying to please God is because he gave me something that I could not earn something that is eternal and wonderful. It's just like this. Me and Mrs. Frost, we are very, 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 very married, and we are very, 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 very much in love. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And because I love her and she loves me, guess what we do? We do things to please each other. Amen. I want to please her. I live a certain way. I act a certain way. I wear a ring to let everybody in the world know if I don't leave it on the bathroom stand in the morning by mistake. And then, boy, do I ever hear about it afterwards. Anyways, and so, and listen, and I wear that ring so everybody knows, hey, he's boughten. Amen. He is not, hey, there's no, hey, listen, he is not on the market. Amen. Already bought and paid for. I am taken. Amen. And the Bible says that Jesus bought us with the precious, precious blood that he shed on an old rugged cross. Amen. And the Bible says we've been bought with a price and the price was the blood of Jesus Christ. Listen, I'm not on the market anymore. Amen. And the simple fact of the matter is I belong to Jesus and he is amazing. And you know what? My father is amazing. And you know what? Just like a little boy, when he looks up to his dad, he wants to do things to please his daddy. Amen. And as a saved man, I want to please my daddy. Amen. I want to please my God and my savior who's done so much for me. Man, I'm telling you what, talk about a changed life. I was something before I was saved and I'm glad I'm not that's something anymore. I'm something brand new. Praise the Lord. God is good. It's good to be saved. We see here, we see a call for service. We see the appeal. Verse number 29, look at it. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. He says this appeal that we have a decision to make. And he says, take, take. You know what that means? He's not going to make you take it. He's not going to come by with this big yoke in his hand and say, catch. Nope. You got to come over to him and take it. Amen. He said, take my yoke upon you. And you know what a yoke is? It's where they put two oxen in a, in a, in a yoke and they tab these oxen plow with that yoke to do the work. Amen. The two of them are hooked up to that thing and the two of them are pulling the plow. And it's the same thing that Jesus is talking about. He's talking about getting in a yoke with Jesus. And you know what? If we're in a yoke with Jesus, I'm promising right now, as you live for him and walk in the spirit and all of those kind of things, 
It ain't no work at all, amen? It's just like, wow, look at this. This is so easy. Look what I'm able to do because our God is awesome. A call for service, the appeal. We see here there's an appeal. He says, take it, please. He offers the yoke but does not ever force anyone to take it. Turn over to Matthew chapter number 7 with me. Matthew chapter number 7 in your Bibles. Matthew chapter number 7. You know what? The day I decided to, to get in the yoke with Jesus was the best, one of the best days of my life. The day I got saved obviously was the best day of my life. But when I actually decided, you know what? I'm going to serve God with my life. That doesn't mean you've got to be a preacher or a missionary or any of those kind of things. Everybody has the opportunity to serve God with their life. Everybody does. And it is the greatest life I've ever had. I, I, you listen, all that stuff I did before I got saved, the making, uh, and trying, chasing bucks and, and chasing this and chasing that and chasing all of these different things, all that did was make me even more miserable. The simple fact of the matter is that serving Jesus is the greatest of all. And man, I'm telling you, Matthew chapter number seven, if you're there, say amen. Look what it says in verse number 24. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them. These are the people that hear what Jesus has to say and actually does what he says. Are you with me? Yeah. I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a what? rock and the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell not for it was founded upon a what rock in other words all the storms of life can come when a child of God decides to build his life on Jesus Jesus is that rock. Amen. That's why we named ch this church Solid Rock Baptist Church. That is Solid Jesus Baptist Church. Amen. That's basically what it's saying. Amen. And we build our lives upon a rock. A wise man builds his life upon a rock. And so when we look and we see this, it says that it was founded upon a rock and it fell not. No matter what comes or goes, it is established. Verse number 26, And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the what? I'm here to tell you something right now. When a storm comes and it rains like crazy, what happens to sand? It gets washed away. It is not a good foundation whatsoever. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house. And it fell, and great was the fall of it. And it came to pass, when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one having what? Authority, and not as the scribes. He wasn't an ear tickler, amen? And you know what? I want to be like Jesus, and I'm not here to tickle your ears. Hallelujah. If it needs to be said, I will say it. And so when we look at this and we see in this passage, we see here, you've got a choice to make. Are you going to be wise or are you going to be foolish? And this is exactly what Jesus did in his entire ministry. He placed decisions before people. Are you going to do this or are you going to do this? Are you going to come with me or are you going to reject me? Are you going to follow me or are you going to follow something else? Can I get a witness? Take up your cross and what? Follow me. And so as we look at this and we see in this passage, we have a decision to make. John 13, 17 says, if ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. The knowledge of having, the knowledge of, of what the Bible says doesn't make a person happy. It's applying the word of God that makes a person happy. It's doing what God says. That's what makes a person happy. What an amazing author by a perfect savior. We have an opportunity to be yoked up with Jesus. Man, what a tremendous blessing that is that we can walk step in step with our Savior. Not only our decision, but also our development. What's the next thing he says here in this passage? He says, uh, uh, and, and back over, if you would please go back over to chapter number 11. And it says, uh, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. He says, and learn of me, our development. In Matthew chapter number 28, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. 
our development. He said, learn of me. How do we learn of Jesus? It's all right here. Everything God wants you to know, look at me, everything God wants you to know is right in this book. You want a successful life? Do what this says. You say, what about this? There's principles, I guarantee you. I don't care what subject you bring up, I can find principles in this book that will apply to that subject. Everything is written in the Bible for our learning and to learn of me. The Bible says over in Hosea, I believe it's in chapter number six, verse number four, uh, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Uh, sad, sad, sad. When we have such a Bible and such an amazing Bible and you hear people, oh, I love my Bible, but they don't know their Bible. They don't love it very much then. Amen. John, first John chapter number two, verse number six, he that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. As who walked? Jesus. Jesus. Not only do we see learn of me, but also meek and lowly. This is how Jesus wants us to walk. These people that run around with a big head and puffed out chest and think they're all that in a bag of chips, amen. Hey, listen, all you got to do is just crush the bag, amen. The chips are dis disintegrated. It's just the way it is. And so look at this now, Philippians 2, 7 through 9. Philippians 2, 7 through 9. I want you to see this about God himself, Jesus Christ. Philippians 2, Philippians 2. It's an amazing thing about our God. He is so powerful, so amazing, so magnificent. The Bible says in Matthew chapter number 28, verse number 18, it, Jesus himself speaking said, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. He has all the power. He has every bit of it. He is super powerful. And look what it says about this super powerful God in Philippians chapter number two, verse number five. Look at what it says. It says, let this mind be in you. In other words, walk as he walked, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be what? Equal with God, but made himself of what? No reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he what? Humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that at every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the who, Father. Amen. And so we see this Jesus, God himself in man's form, and he did it so that he could pay the sin debt that man themselves cannot pay. He became a man so that man might come to be with him. Are you with me? To save them from that awful place. And all they have to do is accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. And he said, learn of me and be meek and lowly. You want power in life? Be meek and lowly like Jesus was. Go over to uh, uh, James, chapter, uh, James chapter number four with me, if you would, please. James chapter number four. He is asking us to be like him. It's right after the book of Hebrews. Hebrews, James. Hebrews, James. If you would please look at verse number six of chapter number four. But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the what? But giveth grace unto the who? Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will what? Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Scroll on down to verse number 10. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall do what? Lift you up. 
Let God exalt you. There's another passage that talks about humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you in due time. And so as we look at this and see this, it is a wise thing for us to humble ourselves in the sight of God and keep ourselves lowly and meek. Meekness is not weakness, amen. Jesus was meek, but Jesus had all the what? Power. It's called power under control. That's what it is. They wanted, the Jews wanted a militant king, a king, not a meek one. They were expecting him to deliver them from the bondage of Rome. But the simple fact of the matter was that time wasn't yet. He had to deliver them from their sin before he could deliver them from their enemies, the Romans. And so as we see this, we see this matter of our development, our decision, our development in this call to service, but also our discovery, our discovery. Go back over to our text in, in Matthew chapter number 11. Look with me once again at verse number 29. And ye shall find rest unto your what? Souls. So in verse number 28, that rest is speaking of rest from trying to work for salvation. You can't earn salvation. Amen. But in 29, it's talking about rest in this life, in living this life. Man, I'm here to tell you something right now. Sin wears us out. It'll make us, it'll just, it just drags us down and ruins our lives. Even as Christians, listen, we don't get a pass on sin because we're saved. Amen. Listen, the truth of the matter is, yes, I'm going to heaven no matter what. But listen, this old flesh still desires to do the wrong. But I'm glad that when I walk in the spirit, I'm reading my Bible, I'm praying, I'm being faithful to church, I'm serving the Lord, and I am, and, and I am casting aside or laying aside the sins that so, so easily beset me, and I'm living for God. Listen, it is like walking on air compared to walking on concrete. Ever stand on concrete all day during a shift? Man, I'm telling you right now, man, that your heels get bruised. Anybody ever bruised their heels working on concrete? I have, and I'm telling you what, it takes a couple of months for those puppies to heal. Woo, man, it is horrible. And so when we look at this, that's what it's like living in sin as a Christian. It's horrible, and it's hard, and it's difficult, and nothing ever seems easy. And the truth is, is it's because we're not walking with him. We're, we're out of the yoke. Are you with me? And so our discovery, it says, and ye shall what? Find rest unto your souls. You'll find it. It's a discovery. The rest is the secret of true service for God. If you find yourself struggling in service and always like, man, I got to get that done. Man, I got man, I got another Sunday coming up. Man, I got another Wednesday coming up. I got to get to church. Man, it, and it's not a delight, but it's a burden. Listen, if you're walking with God as a child of God, listen to me, church. You're walking with God as a child of God. I can rip and snort about every sin under the sun, and you'll be sitting there because you're right with God. And you know what you'd be like? Amen, preacher. Come on. Amen. That's what it'll be. But if you come here and it feels like you're getting beat up every service, that is not the preacher's fault. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> and you got a preacher that I just, I pick a book and I, it's like Psalms. I've been preaching through Psalms for how long now? I, bet I just got done with the book of Acts. We're into the book of Hebrews on Sunday morning. I was working on the book of Ezekiel, which we were going back to here. I don't know, someday. And, uh, and Sunday nights, we've been talking about other things. And so listen, it's verse by verse. If you're getting beat up every time you come to church, it's not the preacher doing it. You're not right. And you need to get it right. And get in that ebb and flow with God. You need to be in step. I'm telling you, when I was in the military... There were some guys that really struggled with left and right. They just really did. They just had a hard time with it. And it really reminds me of a Christian who's not right with God when we're trying to serve the Lord. You know, in the military, when he says right, and if you're taking your left, right, you're right, and you're on the wrong step, you're kicking the guy in front of you, and the guy behind you is kicking you because your feet are mixed up. And what does that cause? The next thing you know, it's causing chaos around, not just with you. You're not going to be the only one to fall if it trips up. It's going to be people around you too. You got to be in step with the Lord. Amen. 
you got to be in step, ebb and flow with Jesus. And the church needs the church to be ebb and flow with Jesus. And this is the problem today. When iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax what? Cold. And that's where we're at today, that great falling away the Bible talks about. And iniquity is abounding in the United States of America. And, and there's churches all over this country that are, that are making sections for homosexuals and transgenders and, and making it okay to come to church that way. And that is not okay. Not even a little bit. It's not okay. I don't care what this world tries to push down your throat. It is wrong. Bible, the Bible very clearly teaches that God destroyed whole cities in Genesis for that very sin. And it's not okay. And it's never going to be okay. Not with God. He calls it an abomination. And I'm here to tell you, it says it very clearly in the Old Testament and in the New. Well, that's just Old Testament. No, we're under grace. My Bible says grace teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. Amen? And that we're to live right in this world according to holiness and godliness. And so when we look at this, we see this matter of our discovery. You want rest? You got to get in step with God. Listen, it shouldn't be pressure and anxiety and restless activity. It should be rewarding and wonderful. Yes, we get tired when we work. But we're never tired of the work. Are you with me? If you find yourself dreading church work, you're in a bad spot. And usually what happens when you're dreading church work, it won't be long before you're dreading church. And it won't be long before you're not even coming to church. Psalm 37, 7 says, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. And then I want you to notice in verse number 30, the assurance. For my yoke is easy and my burden is what? Is, is, does, is Jesus lying here? Then how in the world can ministry be a burden? How in the world can the ministry be be heavy. How can it be hard? And boy, I'm telling you, I'm preaching to me tonight. Listen, I'm here to tell you something right now. When we're doing right with God, it's not hard. It's a pleasure and a joy, and we can't wait until the next opportunity. Listen, the, world, the Lord will never take us where he cannot keep us. He will never push us to where he cannot catch us. He will never try us to where he cannot trust us. And he will never stretch us to the place where he cannot heal us. Amen. 1 John 5, 3 says this, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. So many rules at that church. These are the commands of God. <laughs> and they're not grievous. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in what? Weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and in reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. And Philippians 4, 13, you know it. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Everyone standing, every head bowed, every eye closed. Listen, the call for salvation and the call for service. Every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. If you know 100% for sure you're going to heaven when you die, you are saved. You know that for a fact. You know that you know you're born again. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we're the children of God. If you know you're saved, would you slip your hand up? You know you're born again. God sees those hands. You can put them down. Child of God. Are you in the yoke? Are you in step? Are you in step with the Lord? Has church and ministry become a burden? Has it become hard?
The Bible says it's easy and it's light. Listen, coming to church ought not be a struggle. It ought not be viewed as you're doing God a favor. God's doing you a favor by having a local New Testament church that preaches the word of God and sings the songs of Zion. Listen, come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Not saved in here tonight? Do not know 100% for sure you're going to heaven when you die? You can get that tonight. If you're in here today and you know you're saved, maybe you've never been baptized after salvation and you need to get baptized. Listen, maybe the Bible's very clear about it that we're to be baptized right after salvation. It's not before, it's not, it, the baptism is not salvation. Sal baptism is a, a picture of salvation. It's an outward, it's an outward identification to people to say that you've been saved. That's what it is. It's an obedience to Jesus Christ. Baptism doesn't save anybody. And so when we look at this, if you're not 100% for sure you're saved, you can get saved tonight. And if you are saved in here, maybe there's something God wants you to do. Maybe you've not been faithful. Maybe you've not been, been, been and I say, I'm not just talking about, your, listen, some of you, are, you're faithful to church every service. But the simple fact of the matter is, is maybe you're, you're struggling and it's a battle to get to church and it's a fight to get to church. Well, let me ask you, when did you step off the easy way? When did it become hard? Examine this thing and ask God to show you. When did that take place in your life to where everything in ministry just seems like it's, it's pulling teeth to get it done? Father, we sure do love you. We thank you for your goodness and your grace. I pray you bless now this invitation. I pray you'd help each and every one of us to do exactly as you've commanded. I pray, dear God, that we would be yielded to the moving of your spirit tonight. Help us to obey you. Help us to respond where you want us to respond. In Jesus' precious holy name, we pray the power of his blood we plead. Amen. If God spoke to your heart in some way, shape, or form tonight, why don't you come? The piano's playing. The altar's open. If you can kneel around the altar, come grab. Come and kneel. If you can't, the front row's wide open for you to come and pray. Come talk to the Lord. Amen. Come let the Lord have his way in your heart and life. Hey, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That is the assurance. Listen, you can find rest for your soul. You can find rest. You're not saved. God does want to save you. He desires to save you. He does want to pour his love out on your life.